Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thanks so much for coming. Um, we get started. Um, still, if you're hungry, there's some food on the side there for you to help yourselves. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, thanks for being part of the National Law Society. Um, before we get started, I'm going to hand it off to Professor Cowell in a second. I just want to handle some housekeeping things um, in front of you on most of the uh, seats. There's a QR code. Um, if you want to get involved with the question and answer, go ahead and scan the code, submit your questions throughout the discussion. And then when we get to the QR portion, um, your questions will be addressed. So just make sure I have all your questions ready before uh, beforehand. Uh, if you are at the beta ahead of time, your questions should all uh, already be loaded up in there. So thanks so much. And I'm going to hand off to Professor Cowell. Hey everybody. Uh, part of the essence of education is its ability to provoke us to challenge our ideas. And to me, it's not just to retreat to the familiarity of comfort. So um, as Socrates said, education is the kindling of a flame, not the filling of a vessel. So to that end, I am extremely proud as the faculty advisor to one of our fabulous student organizations, the International Law Society, uh, to introduce and welcome you to this gathering, to introduce you to the panel we have today of two speakers from our undergraduate college who will be speaking on Israel, international law, and the International Court of Justice. So first, we have uh, Professor William O'Mara from the Department of History at Wilson and Wilkinson College. He holds a PhD in Middle East history from the University of California, Irvine, and specializes in the Israel-Palestine conflict. As Professor O'Mara himself put it, he has spent many summers living in Israel on both sides of the Green Line. He has published on the religious dimensions of the conflict and is writing a monograph covering four millennia of history in the Levant from the Stone Age to the current conflict. Interestingly, when Dr. O'Mara arrived at Chapman 15 years ago, the university had no courses at all on the Middle East, Middle East history, and all of those currently in our catalog are his creations. Our next speaker, which I will introduce now as well, is Professor Nicole Rangel uh, of the Peace and Justice Department at Chapman. She is an international lawyer with over a decade of experience advising on international criminal law, international human rights law, international humanitarian law, refugee law, and representing survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. She has worked for the UN as a human rights officer and a legal officer on issues related to conflict and post-conflict societies. Notably, she has had a decade of experience investigating and analyzing alleged violations of international humanitarian and international human rights law, including war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and terrorism, during armed conflict and in post-conflict situations, including Rwanda, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Yemen, Lebanon, and Sudan. I am pleased to direct your attention now to the presentation by Dr. Omer. So is, uh, is this thing on? <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> definitely I'm used to using one of these. I'm used to just yelling. So, uh, all right, then I'll start by a little disclaimer. It is impossible to cover really anything significant in this in 25 minutes. So this is going to seem really kind of rushed. I'm only going to scratch the surface. But what I'm going to try to do is talk more about the causes and consequences of this so we can think a bit more holistically about it. And to do that, the first thing you want to do is start with uh, the question of Jewish generational trauma, um, since this has been building up for a very long time. And there are three basic causes of this. One of them is what we call anti-Judaism, which has a theological basis. So um, the church's idea of supersession, the church is the new Israel, the new chosen people, and the Jews have been cast out for deicide, for having killed God. Then you have Judeophobia, which is based in, um, well, a kind of tribal fear of an other that refuses to assimilate or that can't assimilate. 
So there's a kind of like, oh, what are you people doing here? Um, and then this sort of leads into anti-Semitism, which only develops in the 19th century out of nationalism and scientific racism, which tries to create a kind of secular scientific basis for continuing to hate Jews. Now, this is going to cause certain problems for the whole question of assimilation as Jews begin to gain civil rights in the 19th century, more and more people are kind of like put off by that, and you end up with um, increasing anti-Semitism and attacks, which leads to the creation of a nationalist solution, and that would be Zionism. But Zionism actually has quite a few different definitions. There are five main types of it. The very <laughs> pencil sketch of this would be, well, there's a traditional or messianic element of it, which would be just living on the land as a religious community that has nothing to do with state structures at all. There are three main secular varieties that are all created in the 19th century. One of them is a secular socialist variety, which argues for you know, class consciousness, organizing the Palestinians. But then there's also the... Um, a kind of secular binational ideal that says we should pick like a Palestinian state and work with them, but it's going to be like Palestinian and Jewish and create like a shared future there. Um, and then there's the secular nationalist variety, which is aiming for an ethnocracy of only Jews on the land. And this is going to be, unfortunately, the one that creates the city of Israel. Um, the uh, a fifth variety of it doesn't start becoming significant until after the 1967 war, and that would be a religious nationalist variety that argues for a halakhic state on the land, you know, a, a future temple state. Um, now, the um, Zionism needs to be understood as a settler colonial project, and this is actually how it was understood at the time by the people developing it. We have simply grow more comfortable with that because colonialism has come to be understood as a problematic idea. It was not in the 19th century. It was actually quite normal. And what you have in the earliest stages of settlement to it, a variety of different possibilities developing there because of the different varieties of secular Zionism. But the um, secular nationalist variety is the one that begins to predominate by the early 20th century. And you can already start to see that in writings um, from people like Herzl in the 1890s, where he was already arguing that what you should do is deny the Arabs any work so that they're hungry and then find them jobs somewhere else so that they leave, trying to push people out. And that idea of trying to create exclusive control is going to get grow more uh, stronger and stronger in the decades that follow that in the early 20th century, especially with things like uh, the, the conquest of labor, which creates a kind of um, economic nationalism that calls for the creation of parallel societies so that the, they're completely separated economically and don't interact. And we really should understand something that gets lost in a lot of the continuing propagandistic discussions of this. They were quite open about wanting 100% of Palestine. Ben Gurion was still saying that all the way up to 1948, we want 100% of Palestine. And in fact, continued saying it all the way up until 1966, that that was the, the ultimate goal of this, which makes it problematic to look back at a lot of those uh, partition plans, like the, um, the, the Peel one in 37 that was never actually implemented, the idea of division there. Um, when people say that the Zionist movement accepted it, it did, but if you actually look at their internal correspondence, letters, journals, everything, they're like, yeah, give us anything and we'll conquer the rest. This is the, the, the goal all the time. And this is what makes the Nakba what it is. Um, the uh, planning for it began long before, um, the beginning of it in 1947. And the way people often frame it today is as a response to the 1948 war, where you know Israel declares independence, you know, six Arab powers throw troops into it and try to stop that, and therefore people got chased out. And, the, and people often say, oh, the Arab armies told people to leave. All of this is false. The, the, the process actually began in December of 1947, six months before the British had even left, and they just sat on their hands and watched. By the time you get to May of 1948, 200,000 people had already been chased across the borders by force. And this continued through the rest of the year. The internal discussions, and, and this is actually sort of like, something worth keeping in mind for the entire conflict. Um, it's often, um, you know, people have this, David and Goliath sort of my understanding of this oftentimes, but Israel was the stronger power in every single uh, fight it was involved in, including 1948. And the cabinet during that fight completely dismissed the Arab armies and told people to keep the focus on expulsions, which means that by the end of 1948, more than 750,000 people have been chased across the border, 15,000 of them killed, 
in 70 separate massacres, some of which involved rapes, Scopes are there. Um, and in the process of this, 531 villages were destroyed. Most of them dynamited. That was the official order, dynamite them you can. And 11 urban neighborhoods were depopulated. Of the 170,000 some that were left behind, the problem for them, for what's sometimes called the 1948 Arabs, is that the new state would be an explicit ethnocracy. And the key there is to understand really the, the distinction between national movements and you know, uh, an ethnocracy. So nationalism, if we understand what nationalism is, and Zionism is a form of, of nationalism, I guess first you got to understand that nation, state, and country are different things. We just kind of squish them together in common discussions. A nation is just a group of people with something in common. A state is governing institutions, and a country is a government with sovereign control of land. Nationalism as an idea is saying that nations, groups of people with something in common, deserve a state just for them. But that doesn't mean that you explicitly have to discriminate against other people. It's just framed around that. And ethnocracy claims exclusive rights for a particular group of people and explicitly discriminates against others. So say apartheid South Africa, ethnocracy. Uh, Northern Ireland before the Good Friday Agreement, ethnocracy. Israel today, unfortunately, ethnocracy. Uh, the citizens of, um, of Israel of Arab origin, um, the 22% uh, that exist there today, People often argue that they are equals within the country, and this is simply not true. Discrimination is fully legal inside the country. Uh, I have passed plenty of businesses with signs outside that say we proudly employ no Arabs. Uh, you can be denied housing, denied jobs. Um, there's uh, you know all kinds of like well they used to have uh, separately ethnic ID cards like your driver's license would actually say Duru's Sunni Orthodox Christian they took that off finally because of protests but it's still officially tracked and the, the courts there have consistently rejected the idea of an Israeli nationality your nationality is still tied to ethnic groups now there are consequences for this kind of conception when we think about this as a uh, a state there and you can see that in the kind of well, continual overreactions that the state gives you. And there's just a bazillion examples of this. I'll, I'll give you just one. Um, so in, in uh, 1953 at, uh, at Kibia, so crossing over into what was then held by Jordan at the time, um, 69 people were simply machine gunned. Two thirds of them were women and children. 75 houses were destroyed. The mosque was destroyed. The school was destroyed. All of this was in reprisal for um, uh, Fedayeen killing three Israelis a few days earlier. Um, and that kind of over-the-top response for civilians has marked this conflict from the start. And what we have to understand about the 1967 war, which becomes very important when we think about the occupied territories, right? Yeah, the 1967 war was, was a war of choice that they spent years planning for and trying to get approval for. Um, this was repeatedly discussed in cabinet. They would want to go to war, and then it fun would finally get voted down. The 1956 war, where they got involved with... Um, Britain and France invading Egypt was actually intended to be the beginning of that. They would take the strip there. If that worked, then they would be able to go out to the West Bank. Instead, they had to wait for the pretext in 67. The arguments are often that they were pushed into war. There were provocations. Technically, the closing of the Straits of Tehran is an act of war, but they had been talked down before. The Straits had been closed before and had always been reopened diplomatically. And they were told in 67 by the US government, by our State Department and intelligence analysts that there was no threat at all to them. The, the Arab states had no interest in going to actual war and that if a war actually broke out, Israel would win within five to seven days. Six day war, they, the US got that one right. <laughs> um, the, um, the, the problem here with a war like this, based upon the way they understand the state, is what happens in the aftermath of this. Immediately after the war, within a couple of days, they demolished uh, the Mogherini quarter of, um, of the old city of Jerusalem, which had been there since 1193. They just gave people a few hours, get your shit, get out, and bulldozed it uh, in order to create that nice big open area in front of the Western Wall today. And the, uh, from the very beginning, uh, under Levi Eshkol, the prime minister at the time, the argument is this will be sovereign Israeli territory, they will never leave, and they started planning the first settlements the same year. They actually turn to their own legal advisors and say, hey, can we set aside like the Fourth Geneva Convention and just do this because, hey, this hasn't actually been part of a country since technically, I guess, the British mandate in some regards or the Ottoman Empire, so it's not really occupied. Their own legal advisor said, no, it absolutely is occupied. So the, um, the relevant parts of the um, uh, of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention are 
The occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory it occupies, and it explicitly prohibits individual or mass forcible transfers, as well as deportations of protected persons from occupied territory. Protected persons would be anybody who actually lives there. So mind you, this has been violated in both the Nakba in 47 and 48, in the 67 war, when another 300,000 people were pushed over the border. Um, and ever since, because of the settlement process there. Um, so the question here for many people is, why were the territories never simply annexed if they were not planning on leaving it at all? Uh, and well, it, it's complicated because part of it was. Um, first off, there's a wide swath of territory around Jerusalem that was uh, annexed. Um, this is what people often mean in Israel when they say Jerusalem will never be divided. They're not talking about the old city. They're not talking about the built up area before. They're talking about a ton of separate towns and villages that historically had nothing to do with Jerusalem, but are now part of the municipal boundaries of it. No country in the world recognizes those annexations, and there have been multiple UN Security Council resolutions like uh, 476, 478, condemning this and telling people not to recognize it at all. Um, you have the same basic situation in uh, the Golan Heights, historically not part of, of Palestine, but taken from Syria there. And they were that church was also annexed and also condemned by a UN Security Council resolution, which bans any country in the world from actually recognizing these annexations. So those two territories, as far as Israel is concerned, is part of Israel. The West Bank and the Gaza Strip are held separately, largely because of the large Palestinian population within them. Um, and the key here is that as a condition of membership of the UN, Israel was forced to give citizenship to um, the Palestinians who didn't flee. They didn't want to do so. They actually held them under military rule for the first 19 years of the state, subject to continuing dispossessions and expulsions and all kinds of problems there. But they would have to extend it to many, many more people. And this will be a lot harder to get past. So the problem here, when people talk about the demographic problem inside Israel, it's only a demographic issue because of the ethnocratic nature of the state, um, because it would force, you know, that kind of separate citizenship issues would force a recognition of it as an apartheid structure. Um, the, um, uh, with, with the Gaza Strip too, there's a, an extra piece that often comes up. People talk about, oh, well, people left, they, the Israelis left in 2005. Well, that's not actually true. They dismantled a few settlements that were in there, took a few thousand people out, but they have maintained complete control and sovereignty ever since. Israel is the only recognized sovereign power for either of those countries. They're not part of any other country in the world, which means that the majority of the population of the West Bank and all the population of the Gaza Strip have no citizenship anywhere. They don't, they are literally stateless peoples. Um, the, um, the peace process around the territories um, is a, a complicated issue in itself. And it is in many ways because it's kind of a scam. There's been no faction at any point in Israel's history that has ever been willing to solve the problem and deal with the Palestinians in this way. There's a couple of main ways you could do that. You could offer equal citizenship to all the people there, create a unitary democracy, or you could create two different states out of this. No government, no cabinet in Israel's history has ever actually wanted this. The main thing that they're actually been aiming for is what we call, um, well, which you can call again by, by another parallel, Bantu stance. Thinking of the old South African model where they created different ethnic homelands inside the territory, created a fiction that they were autonomous, but in, in essence, what they did was they encircled people around it and then decided to stop providing any resources and dealing with it, just ignore the population inside it without actually giving up sovereignty. That's what's wanted here. The, uh, the closest you ever get in discussions of negotiations is that um, you can create a Palestinian state that will be demilitarized, have no control over its own borders, um, you know, be kind of essentially a, a weak federated territory, you know, connected to Israel. But even this has never actually been offered. The closest you get is in 2000, the Camp David meetings with uh, Ehud Barak. And in those discussions, he was told before they started that his own, his own government wouldn't pass it that his own party wouldn't pass it, the Knesset would never do it. He had no authorization to create a Palestinian state. You know, it, there's, they've never actually had the ability to do this, which means that you're stuck with um, dealing with the definition of apartheid um, with, in relation to, um, to Israel, in particular to the occupied territories. It is arguably applicable inside Israel as well, given the legalized discrimination um, and uh, the, the whole communities ban Palestinians from living in there. But there it's a little bit more like Jim Crow than it is actual apartheid. In the territories, it's actually indisputable. 
So I want to give just a few basic examples. And again, one of the things about trying to do this in 25 minutes is like every minute of this is an entire lecture. So <laughs> I'm really having to skate by a lot of stuff. Uh, the uh, when you're looking at um, a Cartier board, so let's let's think about some of the things that you end up running into. Um, people are subject to property seizures, right? You know, stealing things all the time from them, uprooting many century old olive trees and transporting them to settlements, or you know, uh, taking property from people. Uh, people would be subject to tons of bureaucratic obstacles to building. They would intentionally build settlements such that you could constrain the natural growth of Palestinian towns and villages. Um, so people are squeezed in more and more. They ask, hey, can I build a second story so my kids have a place to live? I'm like, okay, no, no, no. You just wait and wait and wait for months for a permit. You finally get tired of living six people to a room, so you build on. And then here comes a military bulldozer to destroy the entire family house. Um, you have special ID cards and special license plates that separate people there. So they're under Israeli sovereignty, but they don't have the right to move into Israel. They don't have the right to move freely. There's tons of checkpoints and whatnot here. There are entire communities that are entirely surrounded by razor wire and sniper towers, and some places by concrete walls and sniper towers. And you grow up your entire life surrounded by this. Uh, and then trying to move around. Oh, just a fun story there. Um, so one year, just for fun, I decided to um, hitch a ride with uh, with a comrade in East Jerusalem, who see his car in East Jerusalem license plate. Now, mind you, he's a permanent resident inside uh, annexed territory, but the license plate is still different. We got pulled over several times on the way down to the airport, and we got to the airport before we pulled into the lot there. We were we were stopped, separated, detained, and interrogated for hours. Why are you in Israel? Why are you talking to Arabs? Um, and this is just normal for people. Um, one of the things that tends to bug me the most is what they call special administrative detention, whereby somebody can be arrested and imprisoned for up to six months with no charges ever filed, and they can just let you walk out the door and rearrest you. So people will sometimes spend years in detention with no charges ever filed, think Guantanamo Bay, but apply to an entire population. And this is often used as a kind of collective punishment to take away breadwinners or stop people who might have written an editorial or something. Um, one of the ones that gets me the most is when you use uh, plainclothes snipers to, to shoot kids who are throwing rocks. Um, you know, since the 1980s, we've had major exposés of hundreds of kids being shot in any given year by Israeli troops, and we continue to ignore things like this. Um, the, the kind of uh, treatment that we have been able to document in Israel for decades greatly exceeds what we've ever saw in, in South African apartheid. Uh, and it just does not get discussed. Um, and there's a, a lot of reasons for that. Well, let's see how much time I've got left. Okay, cool. Um, the, um, one of the things you can point to that often comes up in this discussion here is the whole question of of democracy. Oh, well, they elected Hamas. Well, there was an election, like one election Palestinians had ever had, um, that was uh, arranged in, in 06 for them. And in the aftermath of that, we, we actually have tons of statements, including recordings of people like Hillary Clinton saying, well, we should never have let them do that, or we should just rigged it, you know, because, of, you know, Hamas got 44% of the vote um, to Fatah's 41. So neither of them a majority, but Hamas is definitely on top of that. Although largely it's resistance to the party that had been in dominant for a long time. But still, um, the key here is by agreeing to participate in a PA election under the Oslo process, they were implicitly recognizing Israel. This is an opportunity to start bringing them out of the cold and starting to make them a political faction. But the danger of peace is too much. So we withheld aid from uh, the Palestinians and ordered the PA to attack Hamas, which they did. Um, the, uh, and in the fighting there, you end up with uh, the Palestine prisoners document, where members, uh, leaders of all five of the factions got together saying, hey, let's aim for a state on the 67 lines, just in those territories there, and you know, and, and, and still that wasn't enough. And what you end up with in the, the follow to that is Hamas seizing power in just the strip and the split between the two of them. And they've been split ever since. Multiple attempts have been made at reconciliation, all of them sabotaged internationally because you don't want them to work together. Right, it's easier to deal with them with them separated this way. The the key to a lot of this, and where I tend to fall back on, just basic causal relations. If you want to understand how things work, uh, peoples have an internationally recognized right to resist um, to occupation and oppression. This has been 
uh, supported over and over again around the world. What was the entire 20th century anti-colonial movement about, right? And people tend to put this as like, oh, well, if, if they liberate themselves, that means genocide for Israelis, and that's just nonsense, right? It's not what people have been saying over and over again. What they want is some kind of liberation for themselves. One of the things that I would tend to ask people is, why, pardon my language, I'm, I'm, I'm a working class kid, and why the fuck can't Jews, Christians, Muslims, and Samaritans, et cetera, live in the same country and, and have a democracy? You can literally write a constitution that protects Jewish rights that says this is a Jewish homeland, they have a right to come here and move here and live here, so it's a Jewish state, but it's also an equal state with equal laws for everyone else and remove all of the discriminatory factors. You could call it Israel, you could call it Palestine, you could call it both, who cares? There are countries in the world with multiple names, Belgium has three official names. No one seems to get be bent out of shape about that. So, I mean, there's definitely ways around this, but the whole idea that people are going to resist occupation, they're going to resist oppression, is just freaking obvious. And whenever people do, the, the problem here, and one of those states difficult is that if, if Palestinians lash out in anger, then that triggers Jewish generational trauma. But the Jewish generational trauma has been creating Palestinian generational trauma because this has been going on, well, for 76 years since the Nakba began, but you know, more broadly, you know, for 150 years since the beginning of you know, the importation of a foreign nationalist movement. So there's a lot of resentment that's built up there. So you've got two populations with generational traumas, and it creates a feedback loop of anger that just keeps getting worse. You're never going to defeat this by military means. You could kill every single Hamas militant and they would create a new organization tomorrow because a people living in those conditions are always going to resist. What is continually offered to Palestinians by the Israelis is permanent subjugation. That's, that's peace. So peace is when they don't fight back. Peace is when they accept subjugation and colonization. And that's just not going to work. I don't know. Ask the Irish. They fought for 800 years. It took a while, but pulled it off. Or at least mostly. There's still no question of the North. But, that, well, separate point. but either way, people are going to fight back. You know, you're not going to end this. And it sometimes takes a bit of courage to have those conversations. I mean, Ireland is useful in, in that regard as well, because for decades, Britain's like, we will not talk to the IRA. They're terrorists. They have guns. They have to give up the right to resist, and then we'll talk to them. And they're like, screw you, bro. We're going to keep fighting until you talk to us. It finally took a government willing to sit down with them while they were still armed and to work out the Good Friday Compromise. And since then, the IRA has essentially disarmed. And it's been pretty quiet since then. In fact, the current first minister in Northern Ireland is a member of Sinn Féin, the party attached to the IRA. It's still part of the UK, and they're somehow getting along because they agreed to talk and they dismantled all of the ethnocratic elements of the state that existed in Northern Ireland before. That's the, the key here is having that kind of basic conversation. As long as you have Israel arguing that it is a state for Jews, only for Jews, so it uh, has that ethnocratic element, as long as you have the occupation of land wherein non-Jews actually live, as long as you have you know, well, it's obviously they failed to expel that population as long as you have all of those discriminatory laws in effect, you know, you know, controlling people's lives in different parts of this, as long as you have this conflict going on and on and people are getting more and more worked up about it. And realistically, we, we talk a lot about the, the way this is fed uh, a radicalization among Palestinians. If you look back at like the 60s and 70s, it's mostly secular leftists that were attacking military outposts. By the time you get to like, you know, the early 2000s and with some of the Islamists, and then, yeah, they're, they're striking out at civilians and blowing up buses and cafes. And we talk about that process of radicalization. People tend not to notice that exactly the same process has happened among Israelis, that there are radical terror factions. There, there, there are shrines to Jewish martyrs who have committed mass murder against Palestinians in the West Bank in, in, in settlements that I have seen with my own eyes, people celebrating these kind of terrorists. And this is going to keep going and going and going. It will never stop until we actually get people to make a decision. Either create two small countries and divide the land up, which I tend to think is the less just solution because it you know, involves significant ethnic cleansings, or create some kind of constitutional unitary democracy where people can just live in peace, right? You know, and just speaking as, I don't know, um, as a person, you know, I want there to be a thriving Hebrew culture in the land. I like the fact that Jews live there. I don't want a Jewish ethnocracy to exist. So I don't want an ethnocracy in my name oppressing other people. But I don't want them expelled either. And that doesn't have to happen. And it's not what people on the ground are asking for. So if we just 
drop the hyperbole and listen to what people are actually asking, right? We might actually get somewhere with this kind of conflict. So I guess that's, oh, look at that, 25 minutes, hey! <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead and stand because we stood. All right, hello everyone. Um, let me start by thanking uh, Professor Cow and the International Law Student Society, as well as all other students and societies involved in putting on this timely and incredibly important event. Um, I will follow Dr. Amara's lead and try to do the impossible, which is teach you guys four international law courses in 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's start with what is international law in particular, what is international law with respect to this ongoing conflict in Israel-Palestine and the unfolding genocide in Gaza. The law, as I will describe it, is applicable to Hamas as well. And Hamas has committed numerous war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other violations of international law. However, the topic of this panel is Israel and international law. So let's move on. While we're not able to cover all of public international law today, it is important for you guys to have a primer of the framework. So first and foremost, the sources of law are going to be treaties. So the Geneva Conventions, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, the Articles of State Responsibility, and of course, the UN Charter, just a few examples. Customary international law, which is the widespread practice of states um, and a widespread practice that is done because of a feeling of opinio juris or legal obligation, is also a source of international law, as are um, the case law of international tribunals and, in particular, general principles of law, such as general comments from the Human Rights Council. The substance of these sources of public international law also varies and overlaps. So the ones we're gonna talk about most today are use ad bellum, use en bello, or the law of war, or international humanitarian law, or IHL, <laughs> international human rights law, and the law on mass atrocity crimes, including the Genocide Convention. So, Jus ad bellum is the state of law that determines when countries can lawfully go to war. And this is mostly um, under the UN chart. Whether or not um, the war launched was in fact lawful in accordance with the UN Charter um, is a topic of Jus ad bellum. So whether or not it was a war of aggression, for example. IHL, however, governs how it is people actually engage in war, in particular states. IHL applies whenever there is an armed conflict, non-international or international. While Israel has only ratified the Geneva Conventions and not AP or the Additional Protocols 1 or 2 to the Geneva Conventions and not the Hague Conventions, all of those constitute customary international law as recognized by Israel and are thus applicable in this conflict and ongoing genocide. IHL is designed to protect civilians. The central pillars of IHL are distinction, proportionality, and precaution. Under the Geneva Conventions, it is unlawful to target civilians or civilian infrastructure. The only time this changes is when civilians or civilian infrastructure become military objectives. And when in doubt, 
the status of civilian protection controls. What this means in practice is that Israel has violated the principle of distinction when it targeted UNRWA schools, MSF hospitals, um, other emblem protected organizations, uh, aid deliveries, and this is just the start, all right? In addition to the protection of civilian objects, healthcare facilities and personnel are also painstakingly protected under IHL, including under AP3, which Israel has signed. Targeting doctors, ambulances, and healthcare facilities is prohibited under IHL. Even in the very few instances that Israel has argued that hospitals have become military objectives because of the alleged Hamas infrastructure in those hospitals, even if Israel had established this with the necessary certainty to say that these hospitals were military objectives, it is important to note that Israel still then had to protect the other principles of IHL, namely precautions and proportionality, and that these attacks couldn't be indiscriminate. Another way of saying they need to be proportionate another way of saying you can't target civilians. This means that Israel must do everything feasible to assess whether or not their attacks result in incidental loss of life or injury to civilians and civilian infrastructure, otherwise known as collateral damage assessments. And refrain from attacking whenever such damage would be excessive. This also means that Israel must use discriminate weapons when attacking, or at least weapons whose effects can be limited as required by law. In practice, Israel's use of bombardment in densely populated civilian areas, especially Rafah, which has been designated a safe zone and has been designated to be a safe harbor area, also specifically protected under the Geneva Conventions, these attacks have largely been indiscriminate. It is important to note in this respect that Israel has demonstrated and used highly discriminate weapons in other instances. For example, when they assassinated a Hamas leader in Beirut, Lebanon a few months ago. This is to say that Israel does have precise munitions in its artillery, and therefore, under international law, taking all feasible measures to make sure that they are complying with the law means that Israel has an obligation to use those discriminate weapons and also use them in line with all other principles of IHL. All right, in addition to this, all these attacks must also be preceded by precautions. This is mostly warnings to civilians. Israel's attacks on Rafah, a safe harbor zone, corridors, attacks at night, knock and drop attacks are all indications that Israel is failing to provide the necessary precautions before these attacks. So, in addition to indiscriminate attacks, other types of weapons are prohibited under IHL. Some are prohibited because their very nature themselves cannot be discriminated, nuclear weapons. Some are prohibited because of the horrific um, tragedy that they inflict on human life. One of these weapons is white phosphorus which is specifically prohibited not under not just under IHL, but also under um, other conventions with very, very few narrow exceptions. It is prohibited to use white phosphorus full stop in civilian areas. White phosphorus burns to the bone. It burns at 800 degrees Celsius and it cannot be put out with water, and it reignites with um, air, 
In addition to that, white phosphorus causes immense respiratory difficulties, all right? All things that are prohibited under international humanitarian law. Not only has Israel been using white phosphorus against Palestinians, it has also been using white phosphorus in Lebanon, in civilian populated areas all violations of international humanitarian law. Of course, there are numerous other violations going on, and we don't have the time to get into detail of all of them, but some of those that uh, warrant at least listing are destructions of cultural heritage sites and property, as well as both sides' use of human shields, hostages, and sexual and gender-based violence. In addition to the bombardment and the use of prohibited weapons, there are other prohibited means of warfare that Israel has engaged in, including starvation. So starvation is the deliberate starvation of civilians, and it is prohibited under IHL and human rights law. Intentionally starving civilians as a means and method of warfare is prohibited and while IHL prohibits the use of starvation as a means and method of war, international human rights law also requires that Israel and other states respect, protect, and fulfill human rights that are associated with this, namely food, water, and basic needs. In my work in Yemen, another devastating humanitarian crisis another situation where starvation is uncontroversially happening. One of our problems was establishing this intent to starve. Both sides of the Yemeni conflict said, yeah, we know starvation is happening, but we're not intending to do this. And one of the ways that we asserted, tried to prove to the international community that starvation was in fact being deliberately inflicted in Yemen is to point to a pattern of ongoing use of starvation with notifications of warning of that starvation, all right? What this means is in, in international law, evidence of pattern is accepted. And evidence of pattern is often indicative of specific intent or, or special intent dependent on the crime. And this is exactly what we were able to establish in Yemen by looking at these instances. As Israeli officials have both publicly stated that no food or water will be in, allowed in until Hamas is defeated, and Israel has in, continued to engage in IHL and IHRL violations resulting in starvation of civilians, despite being on notice of the ongoing starvation in Gaza, the deliberate infliction of starvation is, in my assessment, not contentious. The only inference on the evidence is that Israel intends to starve Gaza civilians. In line with this assessment of pattern evidence, it is important to note that Israel has also unlawfully targeted objects indispensable to survival. A violation of IHL in its own right but also indicative of other war crimes, including starvation. Israel's targeting of the water irrigation systems, bakeries, as well as aid deliveries are all examples of unlawfully targeting objects indispensable for survival. Before I move on to the international human rights law violations, there are obligations under human rights related to starvation. It is important to note that starvation is an extremely painful way to die, guys. It's been found to constitute also torture, cruel and unusual degrading punishment or treatment, and means of genocide. IHL also provides for rapid and unimpeded delivery of humanitarian aid. Not only are the Red Cross and the Red Crescent protected emblems under IHL, the provision of aid is also protected and required under human rights law. 
just got to skip some things because we got we don't have time. All right. So while Israel maintains that it's facilitating the provision of humanitarian aid and that the burdensome and complicated aid access restrictions are necessary to prevent aid from falling into the hands of Hamas, those restrictions are unduly burdensome, arbitrary, and indicative of starvation, and thus in contravention, contravention of international law. It is crucial to note in this regard that Israel has not just limited aid by about 90% since October 7th, but that the IDF is also indiscriminately firing upon those who gather to receive aid, which is a blatant violation of the Geneva Conventions. The Flower Massacre of 29 February is just one of these examples. I cannot move away from violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law without noting the particular plight of Palestinian children. Just this week, the world learned that Israel has killed more children in the past four months than in all of the global conflicts combined in the last four years. Not only are children particularly protected under IHL and human rights law, they are acknowledged to be an extremely vulnerable group requiring additional protections. I would be remiss not to refer to the MSF reporting that children as young as five have expressed that they would rather die and continue to live under the genocidal situation in Gaza. Additionally, it's important to recall that the prohibition of the use of child soldiers is applicable to both sides, and how this flies in the face of Israeli officials' assertions that Palestinian toddlers can be Hamas, or that all Palestinians are Hamas. There are numerous other violations being committed by Israel that time will not allow us to uncover, some of which are collective punishment, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, other war crimes, violations of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, the Inter International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Of course, we cannot speak about alleged violations of international law without talking about the ICJ and genocide. Genocide is a list of enumerating acts, including killing, inflicting conditions calculated to bring about the physical destruction of a group, serious bodily or mental harm, and imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group committed with the specific intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. Genocide is a crime under international law that triggers affirmative obligations of all states to punish and prevent its commissions. It is under this erga omnis partes duty that South Africa filed suit against Israel at the ICJ, alleging violations of the Genocide Convention. The ICJ, which is the highest court established under the UN Charter, uh, with consent-based jurisdiction to which Israel has consented, while this case may take years to resolve, and will likely be influenced by the case law in Gambia versus Myanmar, Russia versus Ukraine, which are other distinct cases before the ICJ dealing with genocide. This case has a seminal importance, including recognition for the first time before the world's highest court of damning evidence cited by South Africa, which I will allow President Donahue herself to illuminate. The court notes that the military operations being conducted by Israel following an attack of 7 October 2023 has resulted in a large number of deaths and injuries, as well as massive destruction of homes, the forcible displacement of the vast majority of the population, and extensive damage to civilian infrastructure. While figures relating to the Gaza Strip cannot be independently verified, recent information indicates that 25,700 Palestinians have been killed. Over 63,000 injuries have been reported. Over 360 housing units have been destroyed or partially damaged. And approximately 1.7 million persons have been internally displaced. The court takes note in this regard 
of the statement by the United Nations Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mr. Martin Griffiths, on 5 January 2024. I quote, Gaza has become a place of death and despair. Families are sleeping in the open as temperatures plummet. Areas where civilians were told to relocate for their safety have come under bombardment. Medical facilities are under relentless attack. A public health disaster is unfolding. Gaza has simply become uninhabitable. Its people are witnessing daily threats to their very existence while the world watches on. End of quote. Following a mission to North Gaza, the World Health Organization reported that as of 21 December 2023, I quote, an unprecedented 93% of the population of Gaza is facing crisis levels of hunger with insufficient food and high levels of malnutrition, end of quote. The court further notes the statement issued by the Commissioner General of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian, Palestine Refugees in the Near East, or UNRWA, Mr. Philippe Lazzarini, on 13 January 2024. I quote, it's been 100 days since the devastating war started killing and displacing people in Gaza following the horrific attacks that Hamas and other groups carried out against people in Israel. It's been 100 days of ordeal and anxiety for hostages and their families. In the past 100 days, sustained bombardment across the Gaza Strip called, caused the massive displacement of a population that is in a state of flux, constantly uprooted and forced to leave overnight only to move to places which are just as unsafe. This war affected more than 2 million people, the entire population of Gaza. Many will carry lifelong scars, both physical and psychological. The vast majority, including children, are deeply traumatized. Overcrowded and unsanitary UNRWA shelters have become home to more than 1.4 million people. They lack everything from food to hygiene to privacy. People live in inhumane conditions where diseases are spreading, including among children. They live through the unlivable in the, with the clock ticking fast for its family. The plight of children in Gaza is especially heartbreaking. An entire generation of children is traumatized and will take years to heal. Thousands have been killed, maimed, and orphaned. Hundreds of thousands are deprived of education. Their future is in jeopardy with far-reaching and long-lasting consequences. The UNRWA Commissioner General also stated that the crisis in Gaza is, I quote, compounded by dehumanizing language, end of quote. In this regard, the court has taken note of a number of statements made by senior Israeli officials. It calls attention in particular to the following examples. On 9 October 2023, Mr. Yoav Gallant, Defense Minister of Israel, announced that he had ordered a complete siege of Gaza City and that then that there would be no electricity, no food, no fuel, and that everything was closed. On the following day, Minister Gallant stated, speaking to Israeli troops on the Gaza border, I quote, I have released all restraints. You saw what we are fighting against. We are fighting human animals. This is the ISIS of Gaza. This is what we are fighting against. Gaza won't return to what it was before. There will be no Hamas. We will eliminate everything. If it doesn't take one day, it will take a week. It will take weeks or even months. We will reach all places." End of quote. On 12 October 2023, Mr. Isaac Herzog, President of Israel, stated, referring to Gaza, I quote, we are working, operating militarily according to rules of international law, unequivocally. It is an entire nation out there that is responsible. It is not true, this rhetoric about civilians not aware, not involved. It is absolutely not true. They could have risen up. They could have fought against that evil regime which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. But we are at war. We are at war. We are at war. We are defending our homes. We are protecting our homes. That's the truth. And when a nation protects its home, it fights. And we will fight until we break their backbone. End of quote. 
on 13 October 2023. Based inter alia on this evidence, the ICJ has determined that it has prima facie jurisdiction over this case, that the rights asserted by South Africa are at least plausible, that there is a real and imminent risk of irreparable harm to the rights of Palestinians, and that at least some of the preliminary measures demanded by South Africa are relevant to protecting those rights. Put another way, the ICJ has determined that there is a real and imminent risk that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza and that preliminary measures are necessary in order to prevent and punish the possibility of this genocide. While the ICJ did not order a ceasefire, it did order a, a cessation of hostilities that are in contravention to international law. And I believe that the media's reporting on the idea even that South Africa demanded a ceasefire from the ICJ is erroneous. Number one, a ceasefire before the ICJ or as determined by the ICJ would only be applicable to Israel as Hamas is not before the court. So it was never within the bounds of the ICJ to order a ceasefire of both sides. Additionally, the preliminary measures, six of which were passed um, by the ICJ, do indicate that there are violations of international law in the way that Israel is conducting itself in Gaza. By a majority of at least 15 to 2, and in two cases, 16 to 1, with the majority including the Israeli judge, the ICJ ordered that Israel take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the Genocide Convention, including ensuring that its military does not commit any acts within the Genocide Convention, that Israel should take all measures to prevent and public, uh, punish public incitement to genocide, that Israel shall take immediate and effective measures to enable the provision of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance to address, quote, the adverse conditions of life faced by the Palestinians, end quote, and prevent the destruction and ensure the preservation of evidence related to allegations under the Genocide Convention, and submit a report on their compliance with this order within 30 days. Israel has submitted this report. This decision of the ICJ does require Israel to comply with international law. It does require Israel to comply with international humanitarian law to which it has a different understanding than most of the collective international order. And the ICJ does require that Israel comply with the Genocide Convention. The ICJ also recently determined that the situation in Rafa is not one that requires additional preliminary measures. While the ICJ on one hand can be seen as only requiring Israel to comply with international law, it is important to note that its determination that there is a real and imminent risk of violations of international law, in particular the Genocide Convention, being violated through violations of the Geneva Conventions as well as IHL, um, are both things that were already demanded of both sides of the conflict. And thus one can only infer that the ICJ passing preliminary measures, reminding Israel of its obligations under international law, in particular under the Genocide Convention, has put Israel and other states on notice of the very real risk that genocide is being committed. In response to this, several states have stopped military aid to Israel, including Denmark, 
Spain, and the Netherlands. Additionally, at least nine states have cut off their diplomatic ties with Israel, all doing so in recognition that because of the ICJ's decision, any aid to Israel in that respect may also be a violation of the Genocide Convention. The ICJ also noted the particular vulnerability of the Palestinians several times, and that the court is acutely aware of the human tragedy in Gaza. This is important mostly because of one of the ways in which genocide can be committed, which is the inflection of conditions of life where the destruction of the group has been calculated. And I believe that is the situation of genocide that we have unfolding in Gaza today. I will conclude by agreeing with numerous colleagues that the only way forward is an immediate and permanent ceasefire. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I have a list of questions here that um, I will read out. Um, so here's the number. I'm just reading chronologically right now because I haven't had time to look at these. Uh, what is your take on the university and the public's reaction to the Russian Ukrainian war compared to the Israel Palestine conflict? Yes, sir. Um, it's of a big topic and I've actually done things like this on that struggle as well. Uh, there are definitely problems and concerns, especially as regards things like the, the genocide conventions in those cases because of attacks on minority rights and minority languages um, and because of the kind of targeting of, of infrastructure in there. But it's definitely worth noting that the scale of civilian atrocities is a tiny fraction of what we see here. Um, it's actually more comparable to what we see in just an ordinary run-of-the-mill incursion into Kaza, like we've seen every couple of years for a long time. Um, so it, while I think that those are crimes that do need to be dealt with, um, it does kind of distract from this issue. I would agree with that. I would add that the seemingly unconditional support of Ukraine, in particular of the United States, but in general of the international community, is indicative of the double standard that Palestinians have been facing for the last 76 years, which is that we selectively apply international law when we want to, and we don't want to in Palestine. I just, I'm, I'm just gonna ask my own question because I've been thinking about this myself. Uh, the the crime of genocide requires intent, and that's a very, very high level of mens rea. So can you speak a little bit about that? Because in your talk, you have mentioned a ongoing genocide. So how, how would that be uh, provable? Yes. So special intent, um, in particular, the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as required for the crime of genocide is, in fact, in extremely onerous to prove and is the reason why we don't have um, multiple genocides being recognized uh, from the Balkan Wars and is, in fact, a very high threshold. However, since October 7th, the public statements made by Israeli officials, some of which you heard read by President Donahue, really don't leave much room for any other inference than that they intend to destroy these human animals, these beasts, these Palestinians. However, since the ICJ's decision in particular, we don't even really need to rely just on those horrific statements. Like in Yemen, like with the crime of starvation, which also has a special intent or a high level of mens rea, we now have multiple instances of pattern evidence indicating that Israel knew that it was likely or at least alleged to be committing genocide and the ways in which they were doing so. And they have continued to do so, despite those warnings. 
and in some instances, double down on how it is they are doing so. One example I would give, again, is the flower massacre of 29 February. It's very, very difficult to look at the assassination of unarmed civilians waiting for basic necessities to survive and not think that that is done with the intent to destroy or in full or in part the group that is protected, which here is Palestinians. Before I go, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I'd like to add something to this um, from a slightly different perspective since I don't have to deal in the context of law, but um, one of my areas of, of expertise, in fact, a main area of expertise is actually the rhetoric and political psychology of extremist movements. Uh, my first academic position was actually working in a Holocaust library. Um, I teach comparative genocide classes. I teach an entire course on political violence in the world. Um, and if you look at a pattern of statements over more than a century, you can see indication of genocide and intent to do genocide. And we have to understand, this is one of the reasons that I wanted this up here. People often focus on the meaning of genocide as killing large numbers of people. And I see all the time, oh, well, the population's growing, so it can't be genocide. Genocide doesn't have to involve killing anybody, and it still applies because any one of those five fits the definition. And inflicting severe bodily harm and psychological harm counts. And this has been happening for a century here, definitely the last 76 years. Ethnic cleansing is often brought up here too. Ethnic cleansing does not actually have a separate legal category. It is literally a subset of genocide. The Nakba can be understood in these terms. The problem here is that um, it's difficult to prosecute these crimes. There's a very high level there, but you can see them in tons of places. And I discuss a whole lot of genocides in my courses on this that actually won't get recognized by courts because of the way that they have to work with it. But we understand the rhetoric. We understand how to apply this. So on a basic human and rational level, we can look at this uh, as genocide as well. Uh, given the legal and the visual importance of this, I just want to open invite other people who have not had a chance to write uh, a question in here uh, to respond as well. Professor Baser. The thing that you brought, and the reason I'm saying that you brought, because I'm really I'm taking a deep breath, and the reason I'm taking a deep breath is because I'm very sad as to what happened here in the last hour. Um, we were given a one-sided presentation by both speakers. We went, no speaker was going was allowed, was given an opportunity to present the other side. My understanding was that Professor John Hall was to be the moderator, but decided to bow out of this because he thought this was going to be, you know, it turned out one-sided. I don't have time to go through the, you know, the, the whole panoply of statements that those speakers have made. I can say this, that in the, the International Court of Justice has not determined that Israel is committing genocide. We can each have our own opinions, but the decision from the court reads as follows. At least some of the acts and omissions alleged by South Africa to have been committed by Israel and Gaza appear to be capable of falling within the provisions of genocide prevention. The Atlantic Council, in summarizing what happened to the ICJ, said, Today's decision can be summarized with this sentence. The court does not have the evidence to decide whether or not Israel has committed genocide in Gaza, but directs Israel to comply with its obligations under the Genocide Convention, to which Israel as a party to the Genocide Convention since 1950 has long committed itself. When we start wording, wording, using words like genocide, colonial settler, apartheid, these are very powerful words. They're accusatory words. The sadness I feel is that it doesn't promote peace in the Middle East. Between the river and the sea, the Mediterranean River, 
the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, there are 7 million Jews living there. There are 7 million Arabs who call themselves, some of them are Israeli Arabs, who are square citizens, some of them are Palestinians. Nobody's going anywhere. And I think what Professor Nero was saying, and this is, the, well, Israel is an illegitimate state. It should be dismembered. It doesn't have a right to exist. Even though on November 29, 1947, the United Nations went ahead and partitioned Palestine that was part of, you know, it was under the League of Nations. And somehow we should recreate that part of the world to create another state that somehow, you know, the people are going to be living in peace. I just don't see another session of Israel bashing, which is what I heard here, to really promoting peace. I, mean, I call myself a Palestinian nationalist. I want there to be a state of Palestine. I want East Jerusalem to be the capital of the state of Palestine. And I know that over the years, Israel has tried and tried again in order to go ahead and establish that, has not been able to do so. I have, would you like yeah. to respond or do I have a question? Oh, yeah, if, if I can respond to a few points on this. The idea of trying to present both sides in issues like this is, to my way of thinking, as again, a historian who teaches extremism and atrocities, equivalent to asking to put a Holocaust denier on a panel discussing the Holocaust. There are There is evidence, there is actual empirical data on this. We have a century of statements about this and we don't need to dance around it. The question of, of legitimacy, Here's how I would approach that. Would you argue that apartheid South Africa was a legitimate state and should never have been changed? I am arguing for Israel's laws to change and for it to become a unitary democracy for all people there. That some people can also call it Palestine as a separate issue. Because the simple fact is, there is one recognized sovereign power that controls that land. And there's no geographic possibility, no ecological possibility, there's no demo human demographic possibility of dividing that land. It doesn't work. It already has too large a population to be sustainable. So it doesn't make sense to do so. You know, the idea of separating it here, to me, the idea of when you get into the, the whole two-state delusion idea, what it does is it leaves Israel as an ethnocracy, which means that it's 20% of the population is going to continue to live under Jim Crow indefinitely. And I don't think that's tolerable. I think that we need to address those kind of issues. It doesn't mean that you want to get rid of people. Same with uh, from the river to the sea. That is not a call to genocide. It, hell, even if you wanted a, a two-state solution like that, the Gaza Strip is on the Mediterranean and the West Bank is on the Jordan. So what it does say is the settlers in the Jordan Valley would have to go, that that would be their border, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. But from the river to the sea is essentially a call for a democracy in the territory that respects the rights of people there. And that's what I think we should be talking about here. The idea that we need to have uh, to share time with nationalist discourses that spend their time lying about this stuff. I mean, I mean, again, I spend entire semesters unpicking the propaganda around this. And most of what Americans learn, most of what Americans learn on this issue is complete horseshit. Um, replying to some of the legal arguments on this, um, first, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that you have both misquoted the other panelists and myself, as well as respectfully miscategorized the proceedings before the ICJ. This is not a decision on the merits. It is a injunctive stage relief decision. It was never up to the court on, February, on January 26th to say that Israel is committing genocide. So I think maybe returning to the basic principles of law as to how it is court proceedings unfold and what it is is allowed at a preliminary injunctive stage versus what it is is achieved at the merit stage would be something that would maybe help you to wrap your head around our panel. In addition um, to that, this idea that we would have needed to present the other side. Well, first, I did multiple times refer to the arguments of Israel, and I believe I effectively legally rebutted them. 
If you would like to have that debate, I'm open to it. There have been multiple panels at this law school, including two in which you were involved in supporting Ukraine. And not once did anyone suggest that there needed to be a Russian side presented on those panels. I believe that you may have been misinformed as to what this event is, but slandering the panelists in order to express your misinformation is not going to help or get to peace either. This is directed to Dr. Omer. Is there a chance for peace with two states living side by side? My my analysis of that is, is no, and it, it's been no for a very long time. Um, and it's based on a lot of different factors. Um, there are environmental issues, there are geographic issues, there are demographic issues. There's a ton of things involved in this just physically. It would involve displacing about a million and a half people at least in order to achieve something like that. And it's not going to be just to either population. Let's think about this just in terms of how people understand themselves. Think, for example, about the religious population that live in the West Bank. The simple fact is, and this is one of the things you get by looking at the long term of this, the biblical heartland is actually the West Bank. Most of the important sites in ancient Judah and Israel are in the West Bank. If you displace them from that, you know, it, 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 it's, an, it's an injustice to them. But how about all the people who were moved from, you know, living in the rest of Israel, squeeze them into 20% of the land, you know, in a, in a marginal territory that will never actually be fully sovereign, will never actually be sustainable, they'll be dependent upon foreign aid for, for its entire life. If you combine the populations and their resources, they have the possibility to create something beautiful and unique in the world. If you separate them, I don't think either of them stand up well on their own, and it would, uh, in all likelihood, lead to a civil war inside Israel. So I, I don't think it's, I, I think it's essentially, it exists. The main reason that the two-state solution is discussed is to maintain the status quo indefinitely, and this is actually what Israelis themselves have been saying for decades that it's not a serious proposal. No government has ever taken it seriously. They want to maintain the illusion that they take seriously the Palestinians and that there's some possibility of peace, but it allows them to just maintain the current status without changing anything at all. I think that the more we feed into that, the more we talk about that, the more we give free reign to the growth of hell. During the, the height of the so-called peace process in the 1990s, the settler population literally doubled in a decade through intentional construction. They have never intended to carve that territory up and create a separate state between the Jordan and Mediterranean, and they've been saying that consistently from the start. So the only way to, to do that really is to completely violate their rights and their obedience too. You know, you have to, you know, without military force, I don't see a possibility of doing. It. So no, I, I, I don't see a solution along those lines. I do see prospects for peace, you know, for and justice for all populations. So I'm not a pessimist about solving this problem in any way. And I certainly don't want anybody to move from their homes, but I don't think a two-state solution actually works. We have three more minutes. I'm gonna ask this question. What were the circumstances or rather the probability of getting close to a deal before Rabin's assassination? On Rabin was never actually offering a deal, and that that's also was another bit of uh, another misconception. And Ra Rabin himself was was never serious about an actually sovereign state. The goal there was again the way I, I would characterize it as Bantu stance. What they wanted was semi-autonomous areas that they could sort of pen in and leave alone without having to provide resources for them, but give them no actual control of of the the ground underneath their feet, the airspace, water, borders, everything. You know, it would all be under Israeli control indefinitely. What they wanted to do was export some of the municipal and policing responsibilities to another power. That's all that Rabin ever actually intended, and it's all that's in the documents. So our discussion of it as this would have been two separate states, sovereign states in the area, if only you know, Arafat had agreed and Rabin had not been killed, is simply a misconception. It defies decades of Rabin's actual statements. Since we're running out of time, uh, I was wondering if any one of you, either one, would like to make a, a final statement or should we close up? I mean, I'll, I'll just say that I, 
I have I have always wanted there to be peace there. I, I'm quite happy that there's a thriving Hebrew culture on the land, but Palestinians are also people, and you're never going to erase their peoplehood. When people make these racist arguments that Palestinians are just like all other Arabs and whatnot, they're missing the fact that Arabic is like the Romance language family. There are distinct cultures where languages have been adopted and changed over time. They have a distinct sense of themselves, of their own history, of their place on that land, and just Again, thinking long term, genetically, Palestinians as well as Lebanese and Jews literally descend from Stone Age populations. They literally have DNA going back, you know, ten thousand years on that land. There's there's no justification for removing either population from it, but no justification for an oppressive regime and a, a loss of rights. So we do need to, I guess, look for a paradigm shift. I, I still am optimistic that some, some kind of solution is possible, but it does take us thinking about it differently and not, I mean, what, what's, the, what's the old joke about the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and again and expecting it to work. This is all we keep doing. You play whack-a-mole with terror and then you keep talking about let's have a peace negotiation and nothing is ever going to happen. And I can guarantee you this will go on for another century if we don't change the way we think about it. Right. But again, I think that we that the peace is possible in the area. And, and I know and, and I know this both from the history of it as well as from talking to countless people on all sides of this fight in the land. And I'll make it relatively short in my closing, uh, but just to say that you all are law students or studying the law or want to study the law or are lawyers if you're in this room. And impunity is not something that the legal systems can tolerate. Impunity for crimes is the reason why we have international law. We did not want impunity for those involved in the Holocaust and World War II, nor should we want impunity for any state or regime involved in similar crimes today. Well, I'm thankful for the International Law Society for putting together this panel, and um, I'm sure that the panelists would want to continue any conversations with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.